your prayer. How many actually want to hear God speak to them? Let me see your hands. Did you know God still speaks today? He's not a distant God. He's not a faraway God. Sometimes we have a faraway heart. And I just want to help you today. We're doing something called Habakkuk's Hearing Habits. Now I'm not going to ask you to do that three times because it's a tongue twister. And you probably wouldn't be able to, to get it out there every single time. But a lot of people tell me, probably the number one request that I have as a pastor is how do I know when God's speaking? How how do I hear his voice? And so we started this this series last week and we talked about that the primary method that God uses to communicate is through his word. But he uses other methods and he speaks on a regular and consistent basis. And as the song just said, The the song said that he's been speaking in all of time. And sometimes we're just getting to hear it, or or maybe we haven't even heard it yet. So we're going to go over four habits, two today and two next Sunday. So there will be a total of four habits that if we implement those into our lives, I guarantee you, you will hear from God. And so if you've got your Bibles, Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. If not, it'll be showing up on the screens. And this is what the scripture says. I will take my stand and keep watch. I will take my place on the tower or or the watchtower, some translations say. And I will keep watch to see what the Lord will say and how I should answer when he speaks strong words to me. Then the Lord answered me and said, write down the special dream. Write write down the vision on stone so that one may read it in a hurry for it is not yet time for it to come true. The time is coming in a hurry and it will come true. If you think it is slow in coming, wait for it. For it will happen for sure and it will not wait. As for the proud one, his soul is, is not right with him. But the one who is right and good will live by his faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now in the precious name of Jesus Christ, and I pray for for our entire congregation. Those here in Santa Clara, those in San Jose, Father God, those online. We've got hundreds of people watching online in this very moment. Later on, we're going to have people watching by by YouTube TV and various other channels. And I pray, God, that you would speak to every single one of them this morning. 
I pray that your voice would be clearer than it's ever been before. I pray that it would be distinct. I pray, Father God, that your voice would give us guidance and direction, hope, Father God, and that you would let us know how much you care and love about us every single day of our lives. Not just when we're doing good, but even when we're, we're far from you, Father God, you still love us just as much. I pray for revelation today. I pray for insight today. Father God, your kingdom come, your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray, and together everyone says, Amen, and amen, and amen. Well, there was a pastor preaching on a Sunday morning, and, and the church was growing, and uh, he actually had to preach three different services that morning. There was a, an 8 o'clock service, there was a, a 10 o'clock service, and there was a 12 o'clock service. And immediately after the 12 o'clock service, they had this big luncheon and, and kind of a, a, a picnic thing after the church. And, and so he went to that, and he didn't get home till about 5 o'clock at night. And uh, he was exhausted, but it was the middle of the summer, and so the sun was still up for another three or four hours, and his little five-year-old boy comes on up to him and says, Dad, uh, let's go in the backyard and play. Let's play some catch. Let's jump on the trampoline. And, and the dad was exhausted. He was sitting back lying on the, on the couch, and, and he wanted to just watch a little TV and go to bed early, and, and so he thought he would, he would convince his son that he had worked extra hard that day. And so he said, son, you don't know how difficult it is just to be a preacher. You don't know how hard it is to, to, to give of your heart and soul and be a public communicator. And I did it three times today. It's really, really, really hard. And his five-year-old son looked at him and said, Dad, it's really, really, really hard to listen to you three times. <laughs> well, I found that to be true. I found it is very difficult to listen it's, listen, it's hard to listen to a preacher sometimes. It's, it's hard to listen to your spouse, but it's extremely hard to listen to God. This is something that I, I read this week, that, that the brain does not take the most energy in your body. The heart does not take the most energy in your body. It's the inner ear. It's the hardest working organ in the entire body. And I believe your spiritual heart has to be equally hard working in order for us to hear from God. So we're going to go over four habits, two of them this morning, and the first one is this. Stillness. Would you say stillness? stillness. I need you to understand that, that what I'm going to ask you to do over the next two weeks is going to be really, really hard. It's going to be very challenging. Now, uh, you're going to be tempted to give up on it. You're going to be tempted not even to do it because it is completely counter-cultural. In our world today, everything is getting faster and faster and faster and faster. And yet in the Scripture, it seems like God tells His people continually to go slower and slower and slower and slower. In verse 1, he says, I will take my stand. That word stand means to stop. It means to stay. It means to be still in the moment. And when it comes to stillness, God has a purpose. He has a design behind it. Psalm chapter 46, verse 10, very clearly says, Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I'm God. The, the purpose of stillness is so that you can get to know God. It's so that you can know His, His character, His nature, His ways, His methods, His moods, the different facets of His personality. But you can only know that if you spend regular moments of time in stillness. But where do we do that? Where do we find a place in our hurried day? Where do we find and a place in our, in our crowded homes, in our crowded cities? It seems like it's, it's really hard to do that, but Jesus found it on a regular basis. Look at, look at Luke chapter 5, verse 16. Luke chapter 5, verse 16, it says this. Uh, he, or Jesus, continued his habit. Say, say habit. He continued his habit of retiring to deserted places and praying. I, I want you just to stop for a second because if Jesus was in the habit of doing this, we need to be in the habit of doing this. 
And what he discovered was the further away he could get from the crowd, the more desolate, the more deserted, the, w- the more wilderness area that he could find, the earlier in the morning or the later at night when everyone else was sleeping, if he could find that place, he was more likely to hear the voice of God. It's a, it's a solitary place. It's a lonely place because it's just you there sometimes. And when you search for for God's voice, sometimes it feels like there's nobody there. But Jesus' ministry is punctuated by this. Uh, He he begins his ministry with 40 days in the wilderness. And then when he comes out, what does he do? He starts casting out demons. He starts healing people of sickness and disease. He starts raising people from the dead and multiplying bread and and fishes. And then the scripture says, then he goes alone for a period of time. Then he comes back and does more miracles. Then he gets alone with God for another period of time. Then he goes away and he, he starts doing more miracles. I think, well, let's see, Jesus started his ministry with 40 days, and Moses started his ministry with 40 years. Do you notice the difference between Jesus and the rest of us? The rest of us probably need more than 40 days alone with God. How many of you would love to see a burning bush? You'd love to see a burning bush and and hear God's voice speak out of it and, and the voice not consumed. Well, everybody I know wants a burning bush experience, but nobody wants to go into the wilderness. Nobody wants to spend time in the desert. Nobody wants to get alone with God. But, but listen to what the Scripture says in Exodus chapter 3, verse 4. When the Lord saw that Moses had turned aside to see, then God called to him. See, God needs to know you've turned aside that you've taken a time out from life, from the busyness, from the worries, and and, and found not just a, a solitary place, but listen to me. This solitary place can be a special place for you. Habakkuk is communicating here that, hey, hey, I, I'm going up to this watchtower. I'm going to be alone, but, but no one probably knew that he was going to be there. M- maybe it was while he was working. Maybe it was while he was on guard duty, but, but he's also praying and, and spending time with God in that moment. The disciples noticed all of the things that Jesus was doing, and they made a, a connection. They said, you know what? He does all of these miracles after he spends time alone with God. Maybe we need to learn how to pray. Maybe we need to learn how to be alone with God the same way that Jesus is. And and so they go to Jesus and they say, Jesus, will you teach us how to pray? Now, ironically, he doesn't talk about prayer the first three things he says. Number one, he says, hey, hey, prayer is not about standing in front of the masses. It's not about getting public adoration or people saying, good job on the prayer. Number two, you need to find your prayer closet. You need to find this this solitary place. And number three, you need to quit babbling like the pagan does. You need to quit just showing up and saying, God, I need this, I need this, I need this, I need this. You need to come to God in prayer and just listen. But that is a process. Say it's process. It's a process. Especially in our modern age, this isn't easy. This is actually very challenging. And and so to begin the the, the stillness process, the first step is to start slowing down the automobile. I don't slam on my brakes when I see a, a, a light change in the front. If I'm going 40, 45 miles an hour, I start slowing down first. Eventually, I'm going to come to a stop, but, but the purpose is to still my activities Now, how difficult is this? Well, it's really hard. This morning, I'm in my house getting ready for church, and uh, I tell my wife, you know what? We don't have time for breakfast, so would you go through McDonald's drive-thru? Think of the irony. I'm getting ready to preach a message on stillness and slowing down, and I'm in a hurry. I'm speeding her through the drive-thru. Not only am I speeding her through the drive-thru, I don't wait until I get to church. I pull the oatmeal out, and it's instant oatmeal, by the way, and I open it up, and I start eating it while I'm in the car. I am in a hurry. I'm on the run. 
I, I actually heard this week they, they were asking people, do you eat breakfast in the morning? And like 40% of the people or more don't eat breakfast in the morning. And they said, why don't you eat breakfast in the morning? And almost all of them said, we don't have time to eat breakfast. We don't even have time to pour the milk into the cereal. How busy are people getting? I, I mean, it's, it's out of control. Everyone's multitasking, overscheduling, double booking. I, I met somebody this week and, and we were talking about having lunch and, and the guy goes, well, let's do it ASAP. We don't even have time to say the words as soon as possible. We actually have to shorten everything to initials. Those of you who are under 30, you probably don't know, we actually used to use words at one time. We don't use words anymore. Now it's IDK, JK, LOL, YOLO, OMG. That's how we talk nowadays because everything is accelerated. There are three signs that we're too busy. Number one, irritability. Number two is indigestion. Number three is impatience. Anybody notice the impatient people out there lately? How about in the vehicles? Now, I know it's none of you guys, all right? Nobody here or at San Jose, I know none of you guys are impatient, all right? But I notice a lot of the other people are impatient. And I'm on the freeway, I'm driving up and down Bascom or Winchester, and, and sometimes it amazes me. You will look in your rearview mirror and you'll see this car coming, right? And, and, and there'll be like eight cars behind, and they will get into any little gap that they can. They will go on the shoulder. Some of them will drive on the sidewalk just to pass you to get where they're going, you know what scares me? Is now it's affecting the way we walk. Oh yeah, you, you think I'm kidding, don't you? I was at the mall the other day. Guy was doing the exact same thing. He's walking like this. <clears throat> Just going as fast as he could. He got behind this old man in a walker and I swear he was going to honk his horn and say, hey old man, get out of the way. That's how bad it's getting. We need to slow down. Jesus was never in a hurry. I want you to think about this. Jesus had the most important job of any person that's ever lived on this planet, and he only had three years to do it. Three years to do his entire ministry, and he was never in a hurry. He was never out of control. He was never too busy. His ministry had a certain spontaneity to it. That while he was walking from one destination to another, if somebody wanted something from him, he'd actually take time out to do it. There, there, there were times that he would, he would go on a completely different path just because someone asked him, will you come heal my daughter? Will you come heal my son? I, I'm amazed at the informal nature of Jesus' ministry. There weren't a lot of time restraints. It wasn't you got to get this done in an hour and you got to be done because we've got something else more important to do than being with Jesus. I didn't notice that. I didn't see that. Jesus had actual relationships and friends, people who, who understood him to a, a certain degree anyway, people that he definitely knew and spent time with. One of those stories is found in Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 38. It's the story of Mary and Martha. We all know the story. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. So she's being nice. She's being hospitable. She had a sister called Mary who sat at, at the Lord's feet listening to what he said, but Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. So, so get the picture. Martha invites Jesus on over. Jesus gets there, and, and he goes and sits on the couch over here, and, and Mary just sits down at his feet, stares into his eyes. It's just ready for, for any word that comes out of his mouth. Jesus is maybe telling some stories. Maybe he's talking about the day. Maybe he's telling a parable. Maybe he's, he's teaching something, but it didn't matter to Mary. All she wanted to do was listen, say listen. That, that's all that mattered, was listening to Jesus. Martha, on the other hand, there are rules. There's etiquette. There's things that have to take place. And so the scripture says she's distracted by the preparations I need you to understand that Jesus Christ is here today just as real, just as alive as he was in that story. And one person chose to sit at his feet whereas another person chose to be busy about something else. Look what the scripture says. It says, but Martha was distracted. She came to Jesus and asked, Lord, don't you care? I find that... I." 
ironic. I find it silly. Why in the world does she interpret Jesus being Jesus as not caring? Why does she interpret Jesus' feelings for her through what her sister is doing? None of it makes sense to me. But in her mind, she's distracted. Literally, she's being torn in pieces. She's, she's being pulled in, in different directions at the same time. Listen, listen. I've been left here to do the work all by myself. Tell her to help me. Jesus responds, Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset about many things. Now we know she's distracted. The distractions are causing her to be worried, and the worry is causing her to be upset. And so it just multiplies. It gets worse and worse. The, the busyness of life takes away the joy that she has in her friendship with Jesus. Now she's being burdened down by the worry, and she's, she's getting upset and mad and frustrated and angry at the whole entire situation. In the Greek language, the word right there, the root traces back to the word noise. And so what it tells me is this woman is allowing the noise, the chatter, the busyness, the craziness of life to distract her from her relationship with her friend, with her Lord and her Savior, Jesus Christ. Listen to what Jesus says. You're worried about many things, but few things are needed. Or, indeed, only one Mary has chosen what is better and it will be not be taken away from her. Mary has chosen the one thing that is better. There is nothing, say nothing, there's nothing better than spending time in the presence of Jesus Christ. You have never wasted a moment if it's in pursuit, if it's seeking, if it's in the presence of God, that is not a single moment wasted. But many people, maybe most of us, are guilty of wasting a lot of time during the course of our lives. You know what's sad? Is Jesus' presence brought Martha pressure and it's supposed to bring pleasure. Sometimes even going to church, we're so pressured. It's supposed to be a pleasure. It's supposed to be a good thing. And so we need to slow ourselves down, the activities around us. Then we need to start silencing the distractions. That means stilling our minds. And when I say stilling our minds, this is what I'm talking about. I am challenging everybody at Bethel for the next four weeks, say four weeks, to turn off all electrical gadgets. I'm not talking about the lights in your house, all right? I'm talking about things like video games, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and all social media. I'm talking about even turning your phone off at night when it doesn't need to be on. No more uh, 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 of the constant connection and communication because for the next four weeks, remember, we're on this series entitled The Voice. We're trying to learn how to hear the voice of God. We're understanding that one of the things we need to do is we need to slow down, but we also need to still our minds. So that means we have to unplug electronically. I'm not going to watch any television. See, I watched the Warriors yesterday. They won game one of their series. We know it's in the bag. We don't need to watch it for the next couple of weeks, right? Every person who's a Warrior fan can, can rest assured your Warriors have it in the bag. This is the perfect time not to watch because we're going to be watching for God instead unplug electronically put your work away at night put your kids to bed just a little bit early so maybe you and your spouse or you by yourself can spend some more time with god quiet your mind see guys do you guys understand we want to talk to a spirit being you and i are physical beings and spiritual beings we're both we, we, have, we have two different parts to us, body, soul, and spirit. If you throw in the mind, that's a, a third distinction that we can talk about. But God is spirit and has mind too. So, but he does not have a physical body. So he does not communicate primarily through audible voices. He communicates in the spirit realm. The Bible tells us this. The scripture says that those who worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. If you want to communicate to God, that means you need to talk to him spiritually speaking. You need to seek him in a spiritual manner. Jesus said that his words are spiritual 
spirit, all right? So there's a spiritual element to this thing. You go, go Pastor, how do we do that? Well, I, I know speaking in tongues is a heavenly language that God has given us, a spiritual language, and so sometimes when I get to this point, to calm my mind, I speak in tongues. Sometimes to calm my mind, I, I have a, a journal out, and I write down, because here's what happens in our humanity, all right? Okay, God, I'm getting serious about spending some time with you. I'm really going to listen. And then all you can think about is all the things you have to do that week. What runs into your mind is job responsibilities, family responsibilities, where you're going to go to eat. So this is what I say. Take your journal, write all those things down. Eventually, sometimes it takes three minutes, sometimes it takes five minutes, you will exhaust all of those worries and those cares in your life and you will know they're written down so I can take care of it when I'm done spending time with God and, and so it, it just kind of eases the mind maybe confess of some sins maybe maybe sing a song even I find it interesting that in 2 Kings three fifteen, Elisha is brought before two kings and they say we need to hear a word from God and Elisha doesn't even want to be there he doesn't even want to be with these two kings. He's mad that he's been called. He's a little upset. But in order to get him in the mood, he says, would you bring a musician or a minstrel so that they can play something and it can change my mood? I'm going to be more receptive to hearing for something from God. That doesn't mean you play the music the whole time. What I'm saying is it, 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 there might be a, a, a point where you turn that off to, and then here's the final thing. Shut your mouth who can say amen, amen. say amen I, I, i'm telling you, we need to still the activities still our mind and still our mouth because what we want to do is we just want to to word vomit we just want to get before god and and say all of these things and, and say them in spiritual quote ways where we sound like we really know what we're doing when god's saying i want to talk to you most of us are modern day marthas in need of a merry experience we need to sit at jesus feet and listen and we need to stand in our watchtower at attention so I'm going to be your drill sergeant this morning, and I'm commanding you, attention! That's what I'm doing. Aye, aye, I love it. Thank you. Aye, aye. Because habit number two is attentiveness. Habit number one is stillness. Habit number two is attentiveness. And I am telling you, if, if you've been married for over a year, you wonder why your spouse is so inattentive. If you have friends that you talk to on a regular basis, you wonder, why, why are they not attending to me? Why are they not listening to me? Why, why, why can I not get my message across in any way, shape, or form? The Scripture here says, I will take my stand and keep watch. The idea here is to look. Look intently at something. The idea is to, to inspect. The idea is to give your full or, or pay attention to what's going on. One of the early church fathers believed inattention was the greatest enemy of your spiritual life. So we've got three little things that we're going to talk about in terms of attention. Number one is this. Attention is looking. Just say looking. Little girl, she walks on into her dad's den and she says, Dad, uh, I've got something to tell you. And he goes, mm-hmm. He's reading the newspaper. She goes, Dad, 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 I, I, I've got a story to tell you. Mm-hmm. Dad, are, are you listening to me? Mm-hmm. Dad, I need you to listen to me with your eyes. The little girl wanted him to look at her because she realized and recognized that the only time he's really listening is if he's looking. Now, I want you to think of this story again. Habakkuk says, I'm going to go to my watchtower. Now, we've got some pictures of watchtowers here that are going to help you understand this a little bit because the watchtower is elevated. It's higher than any other place in the city. And, and so when you get into that elevated position, you have an elevated perspective. So what are you looking for? Well, you're looking for a sign. When I'm in my solitary place, I, I'm looking for a sign of, of God's arrival. 
What a guard did in a watchtower is, is the soldiers and the king would be out fighting somewhere and he'd be up there and, and so he'd be looking for a sign like, like maybe some, some birds, a flock of birds flying by who were just disrupted or, or maybe some dust way out on the horizon, some dust. And, and that would tell him, I think the king is coming back. I, I think the king is about to arrive. And, and, and if that didn't work, then, then what I'm asking you to do is I'm asking you to take your Bible with you into this place and, and start peering through it kind of like a telescope so that you can get a clearer picture of God on the horizon. Remember we said last week, this is God's preferred manner of communication. This is how you understand his ways. This is how you understand his character. And so what's cool about this is, is in one part of the Bible, you will read the story of creation. And you will understand that God is mighty and powerful and strong and, and unstoppable and, and maybe even a little scary. Maybe a little intimidating to a certain degree. But, but then you read another story about Jesus, and Jesus is God incarnate or, or in the flesh. And Jesus is gentle and, and kind and loving and and, and, and he's got this mixed personality that, that is a little intimidating, but it's really magnetic and, and drawing in, in another way simultaneously. So we're looking from this elevated perspective, but, but here's what's important to understand. As a guard, you have to look 360 degrees. The king could come from any direction and what I've discovered is we human beings, we hear God's voice one time in one manner and we think he's going to do the same thing every single time. And so we get stuck looking this direction or maybe this direction when God is speaking from back over here. He's trying something else. It, it reminds me of, of when Robin and I were raising our four kids. We... Uh, uh, you know, we tried to be good parents and we tried to feed them on a regular and consistent basis. And, and uh, so, so I, I remember one time we were on a hot dog kick. I don't know if you remember this. And uh, we were boiling hot dogs on a regular basis in, in the springtime. But, but in Las Vegas, it gets hot real, real fast. And so we said, hey, why don't we go on outside and, and barbecue on the grill? and put some hamburgers on the grill and some hot dogs on the grill and so that's what we did and so we, we bring the food on in and we, we set the hot dogs in front of our kids we, we put the hot dogs on the buns and we get the ketchup out and, and like one or two of them were going ick, I don't want to eat that and we're like, what? We, we've been eating the hot dogs for the last month you love hot dogs yeah, but it's got black things on it right now so be, because of the barbecue would put a little black mark on it, which actually makes it taste better, okay? And my kids say, it looks funny. It looks different. It's not the way we've always done it. And we Christians do the exact same thing. God's speaking, and he's saying, hey, I'm doing it a little different. Are you listening to me? I'm still speaking. It barbecues better than boiled hot dogs. So we've got to have that 360 degree perspective. You see, I'm just going to give you a couple of ways that God wants to speak to you over the next month. He wants to speak to you in your circumstances. Okay? He wants to speak to you even through nature. This, this weekend, Robin and I went walking and uh, the rose garden is about, I don't know, a mile and a half from our house. And so we walked to the rose garden. And I didn't know you all were going to be there. All one million people in San Jose were at the rose garden this weekend. So that, that busyness and craziness I was talking about, it was all there all over again. But when we got there, you know, you're walking amongst the rows of the ro roses and you see red ones and and purple ones and yellow ones and salmon colored ones and all these different colors and we made it all the way back to our house and uh, I walked on over to our backyard because we've got a bunch of roses in our backyard and I just looked I got really close to one of the roses and I felt like God say you did nothing for that rose to be there and I'm thinking well, what's this all about he says you didn't plant it you didn't water it you didn't prune it but I had it bloom just for you. And so in your life, there's things that you don't plant, you don't water, 
and you don't prune, but God can have something bloom just for you because he loves you, because he does care about you. And that was a, that was a revelation to me. That there are other ways that God can speak. Do you know churches used to have stained glass? Has anyone ever been to a church that has stained glass in it? Okay, even Bethel over at San Jose, the campus there, you guys have some, some stained glass in the prayer chapel and in um, Keys Chapel and a couple of different places like that. And there was a method to that madness. The reason why they had, had stained glass was it usually depicted a scene from the New Testament. And whatever it was, Jesus walking on the water, Jesus feeding the 5,000, um, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, the point was you are supposed to stare at that, that glass window, kind of like the Orthodox Church stares at, at icons, and you're supposed to imagine what it would have been like to be there with Jesus. Could you imagine sitting and, and seeing Jesus take a, a sack lunch and feed 10 or 20,000 people with it. Just reaching in, and you're in the back row. You're like, oh, there's not going to be anything there for me. And he just keeps reaching and grabbing out more and more and more. That's what stained glass is supposed to do. That's what icons are supposed to do. You're supposed to imagine these, these different scenarios in your mind, and God can speak through that. How many of you know that as, as a, a Pentecostal church, we believe that God is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? Who can say amen? amen? Okay, so that means the Holy Spirit is the one who is present here on the planet at all times. Some people are baptized in the Holy Spirit, but everyone has been born into the Spirit who is a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, the way that Paul communicates that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, is he says, don't you know that you're the temple of the living God? And we all go, yeah, yeah, I'm the temple, I got it, that, that, that makes sense to me. But a couple of verses earlier, he says this. He says that when you've become one with Jesus, uh, you've become one with the Spirit. Or when you join Jesus, you've become one with the Spirit. And the words that are used there in the Greek language are the words for glue, cement, and fuse. In other words, your spirit, when you're born again into the body of Christ, you're, you're now a Christ follower, you're now a Christian, as they call it, you now have been fused, cemented to, or glued to the Holy Spirit of God himself. So if you're in that close and intimate of spiritual connection to God's Holy Spirit, do you think he's going to talk to you every now and then? We call them promptings. Of course, I think the Holy Spirit is getting tired of being called prompting or nudge or, or hunch or intuition or gut feeling. Have you ever been in the shower and an idea just came to you? Have you ever awakened in the middle of the night or maybe early in the morning and, and, and there's an idea formulating in your mind and you're thinking, where did that come from? If you're a Christian, it came from the Holy Spirit of God. See, you need to understand that sometimes the shower is the only place God has ever been alone with you because you're so busy doing so many things. God's Spirit wants to talk to us. Attention isn't just looking, though. It's patiently looking patiently looking psalm 25 5 says this lead me in your truth and teach me for you are the god of my salvation on you i wait all the day how long do you wait for god think about it when you get in prayer and you're wanting to hear god's voice how long do you wait you know may, maybe like me i'm guilty I'll pray for 10 or 15 minutes, feel pretty good about myself, and say, okay, Lord, I'm ready for you. And about two minutes later, I get up and leave the room. Five minutes on, on a good day, may, maybe 10 minutes when, when we're in prayer and fasting. David says, I'm going to wait all day long. Well, now, we all recognize that the average attention span in, in America has gone down because of all of the electronic gadgetry. If you're being socially engaged, the, the average attention span is 29 minutes. If you go to a movie, the average attention span is 24 minutes. If you're in a business meeting, the average attention span is 13 minutes. If you're driving a car, the average attention span is only 10 minutes, which scares me a lot. 
attention is looking long and hard at something. Something is given when you look long enough. An insight, a revelation. I challenge you this week, grab your Bible, read a verse, read three verses, and do not get up until you hear God speak. Stay with it. Persevere in the moment. Say, God, I need to hear you. Attention takes the time to fully explore something, to discover whatever there is to know about the thing that you're wanting to learn about. And sometimes that takes fresh eyes, a fresh looking at something. Have you ever thought you've heard every message available at at church? Or maybe you've seen every plot line that's ever been there. Look at something with new eyes. A little five-year-old girl, she was spending the weekend with her grandparents. Sunday morning, grandma wakes her up and says, it's time for church. She goes, I don't want to go to church. And grandma said, well, well, at church you get to learn about God. And the little girl says, I already know everything about God. Grandma said, you know everything? I'm a grandma and I don't know everything. And the little girl says, well, maybe you haven't been paying attention. No, we can pay attention every day with full attention 24-7 and we'll never learn everything about God. His personality is so beautiful, so awesome. God's speaking to you right now. Did you know that? Matthew chapter 6, verse 34, give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. Right now, He's speaking. Right now, He's doing something. Jesus said, I don't do anything except what I see my Father do or say. That's it. Every single thing Jesus did, I I can't say that. I have a lot of wild hair ideas myself that I just start doing, and then after the fact, I go, oh Lord, would you bless those things I just did back here? Or or, or, should I go a different direction? Sometimes it's, it's too late. Here's the bottom line. Final thing. Attention is love. Say love. Attention is love. My wife wants me to pay her attention. When she gets her hair done, I, I can see the look in her eye. She, she's like... <laughs> I, I, she wants me to notice her. She wants me to appreciate her. And if I love her, I will. If I love her, I'll be on the lookout for these things. It shouldn't be difficult I mean, when she she makes me a a special dessert, how can I not say thank you? How can I not do way more than say thank you? And yet there are times that I don't. All the things that God has done for us, it shows respect when we pay Him attention. It, It brings us access to Him. When I pay attention to my wife, I have access to her world. I could ask her anything and she would do it anything and she would do it because I've paid proper attention. Leighton Ford says this, attention's the only faculty of the soul that gives us access to God. Do you know why? Because when you're paying attention to God, you're saying, I'm available. You're saying, I'm all yours. I'm all here. I'm ready for whatever it is you have to say to me right now in this moment. I am listening I'm watching. Send me a dream. Send me a vision. Send me a a, a thought in my mind, something spontaneous. We'll teach how you discern what's your thoughts and someone else's thoughts in a couple of weeks, all right? But you can do that. Dr. Yonggi Cho said that the language of the Holy Spirit is oftentimes a dream or a vision. I think we have so rationalized Christianity nowadays that many of us don't even believe in the supernatural anymore. We are a part of a Pentecostal church. That's way more than speaking in tongues, just so you know. That means we believe God still does miracles today. That's what we believe. We believe that we serve a God who wants to talk, who wants to communicate. And and, and when you serve a God like that, it's going to transform your very existence. Listen, listen, there's a doctor by the name of Rick Hansen He said, attention literally shapes the brain so that what we pay attention to 
is literally what we will build into our brain tissue. Our neurons wire in response to what we focus on. Would you stand with me, please? Uh, Nolan Ryan, uh, one of the greatest pitchers ever in Major League Baseball. Uh, strikeout king. I think it's over 5,000 strikeouts. And uh, this amazing man over years and years of being in the majors. And his wife said this interesting thing about him. She said uh, she was commenting on what her favorite thing was about Nolan Ryan. And Nolan Ryan would, and she says, you know, it wasn't the strikeouts, although it was, am it was amazing to watch that. It wasn't the wins he accumulated, although it was amazing to watch that. It was the fact that every game that she was present, he would step out of the dugout or step off the mound, and he would look across the stands till he found his wife, and then he would acknowledge her. It would be a wave of the hand, a tip of the cap. I hope you know in this game of life, you're on the field. I think we need to all stop look through the stands of our life and realize God is in the crowd watching and we need to stop and acknowledge him. That if we would every day stop and make time to be attentive to God, you actually might just start hearing him regularly. And in a message about hearing the voice of God, did anybody feel con like just the Holy Spirit speak into your heart, say, you know what, I need to hear God's vo voice more in my life. Pastor would talk about Habakkuk, like that was it. He made a habit of hearing God. Like I need to make a habit of listening and hearing because God's speaking. I just need to open my heart, the ears of my heart to hear him. And uh, if you're here today, why don't you just bow your heads just for a moment because some of you, could hear God speaking very clearly to you because you realize today, you're like, you know what? As Pastor Tom is talking, I realize I'm, I'm pretty distant from God. I feel far from God. And uh, when we're talking about hearing God's voice, that's a, it's describing a relationship. And you could even just say, you, know, you may even say, you know what? I don't really have much of a relationship with Jesus. But I'm here today, this is you, and you would say, you know what, before I leave today, I want to get back close with God. You could describe it as recommitting your life, or you're saying, you know what, I just need to get back close. I've been far, and I need to get back close. Or maybe you're saying, I've never been close with God, never had a relationship with Him, but today, I want to decide to make Jesus Lord. I want to, I want to be close with Jesus with no one looking around. You need forgiveness of sins, a new start, whatever you want to call it. You're far from God, but today you want to get back right with God, close with God. Just wave your hand at me. With, just wave it at me real quick. Just right where your hands in every section are already going up across this place. God's been speaking. Revelation says he's knocking on the door of your heart. Some of you felt that pounding. Felt like that was the Holy Spirit actually talking to you and saying, just come back to God, come back to him. Anybody else, just wave your hand up me just before I move on. Okay, just, if we could all bow our heads. If you're a believer, you're close with God, I want you to pray with them because I want them to know there is a family that's gonna stand by them through this journey of faith. Let's pray with each other right where you're at. Say, Lord Jesus, I want to be close to you. I want to have an intimate relationship with you. Please forgive me of any sins in my life, anything that's caused me to be distant. Today I choose to make you my Lord and Savior, to follow you. I believe you died and rose again, and I commit to live for you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in hearts. New life literally is beginning inside of them. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says you're making them a new creation. The old is gone. They don't have to live in their pasts anymore because they responded to your voice. It's a new day. Maybe you're here today. This is a call for believers and anyone, even if you wouldn't call yourself that yet, but you would say here today, you know what? 
As he was talking, I just, I need to hear God more in my life. I want to make that more of a habit. I'll raise my hand for this. If that's you, just raise your hand and just say, you know what? I want to respond to to say, Lord, I want to hear your voice more in my life. I want to make that a habit of hearing your voice. Just lift your hand up to the Lord because here's what we're going to do. You can keep your hands raised. Lord, we ask, we know you're speaking. So Lord, we want to make a habit of listening, of hearing not just on a Sunday morning, God, but every day that we would step off the mound like Nolan Ryan did. We would step out of the uh, dugout and make that attentive moment, that stand moment where we would stand and look for you to hear you. So Lord, I pray that God, our, the ears of our heart, you said, let him who has ears, let him hear. God, we make a choice today to listen. So as, uh, as Pastor John and Romy are going to sing this song once more, Lord, we pray that you would speak to us because we are ready in faith to hear and obey. In Jesus' name. Words are hearsay. You've been speaking now for all the time. All the time. The words are hearsay. you Oui.